All right, can I have your attention, please? Our next speaker is uh, Michael Meeks, and he will be giving a talk about the scaling and securing LibreOffice Online. Please give him a round of applause. Well, it's very good to see you today. Thank you. Thank you for coming and hearing about these exciting things that are uh, feeding back uh, on the microphone. Excellent. Uh, LibreOffice Online, what a, what a wonderful uh, idea. So, there are some people I talk to and they say, ah, oh, but this is old hat, it's easy. You know, we, we are already doing it. You know, we, we have LibreOffice in our browser. Um, we've been using it remotely for years and that's, and that's fine, right? That's great. And it's entirely true. Um, you know, people have done this for years. You know, X11 is older than I am, almost certainly, and, and, and showing it, you know. Um, NX is doing a great job of this. VNC, you know, Oracle and Olivetti Research uh, made it, uh, Citrix. Uh, Cloudon was a particular fan of ours. They were a customer, actually, of, of Collabras, and they did a great load of work in LibreOffice that was really good. Um, but they would actually record the screen on an Amazon VM and convert it to an H.264 video and play it on your tablet, you know, thus bringing, you know, Microsoft Office, yeah, sadly it was Microsoft Office at the time, to your tablet. But, you know, this sort of idea is, is relatively new. Our iOS, um, Amazon Workspaces, lots of people doing this. But really what these guys are doing are cutting really very, very low in the stack. They're stealing pixels at this sort of level, right? So there's a whole lot of things the application knows and can tell this lower level that they just completely miss out on. And we'll have a look at that, you know, how that pans out in a, in a second. Let me, uh, I should have brought my remote. Terrible, isn't it? Um, so uh, they do it, all sorts of clever tricks to make this perform nicely. So um, they try and work out what you have done and then, you know, uh, do it more efficiently on the client. So they, they try and detect uh, movements or changes to icons to, to versions that they already had. So, you know, hashing little bits of screen to see if there are already copies on the client so you can reduce the bandwidth and so on. Um, trying to work out exactly what happened as you went between here and here. Um, and it, it can take quite a while to do this. It's not, not uh, terribly efficient. Um, and also, it really needs to learn about the application to some degree. So it, it's fair enough to have cached versions of menus. So I think NX does this. You know, when your menu pops up, it knows what was there last time. And it's got that on the client already, so it can do a much better job of you know, very quickly uh, uh, responding bandwidth-wise. You know, this takes time, it needs to be pre-populated. Seeing around corners is hard. And one of the, the areas that's particularly hard is when you do a page down. So if you do a page down in your document, you suddenly get a big chunk of new content. And it just can't be seen that that's going to happen at this level. So you get a nice copy, and then you get a big hole, and it slowly fills with content, which is a shame. So seeing around corners uh, is difficult. However, LibreOffice Online has none of these problems. So we can... Um, we can enable all sorts of even more clever tricks inside because we know what is down the page. You know, isn't that clever? You know? um, so it, it's happening at a totally different layer of the stack. And uh, that gives us just a, a huge insight into the document, the document model. In fact, we don't even need to start the application in order to provide you with the pages that, were, you know, that we know are going to be there. As long as we've rendered them before at a similar Zoom, and we don't even have to start LibreOffice up, we can just serve it straight out of the cache. And so we can do all sorts of nice things with life cycle, and we can see around these corners and we can do just a, a, a much better job. That's the thesis, anyway. Look at that. So how do we do that? We have a thing called LibreOffice Kit. Kits were very trendy at one stage, I don't know. Package kit, you know, console kit. I don't know. We have a LibreOffice Kit. Inevitably, you know, OpenOffice.org sounded like a good name back in, the, uh, you know, back in the day. But maybe we'll evolve the name as we improve the software. Who knows? Um, this exposes the core uh, of LibreOffice, so that those file format filters, uh, the ability to render that content, and editing, you know, so the raw uh, core editing functionality, which I think are things that make LibreOffice outstanding and, and different in its class. Um, it's an extremely simple header-only API library. Um, so, well, library. You include the headers, and it will deal open your LibreOffice on your uh, system, and it will pull loads of goodness out of it. And you don't need to link against LibreOffice. You can have a very small application that compiles in a nice little box very quickly, like this. Um, you know, really, five seconds to compile LibreOffice online sort of thing. It's not a, it's not a massive uh, job. And yeah, and so, so that's pretty sweet, you know, just being able to pull, pull the pieces out that you want. Uh, so there's no sockets, there's simple initialization. You know, there's really very, uh, very little 
uh, that you can screw up. And it's used by LibreOffice Online. It's also used by Android for doing the tiled rendering on Android. And there's a huge similarity between Android and uh, LibreOffice. And you know, Document Foundation did a great work. All of the donors to the Document Foundation uh, helped fund work on uh, making LibreOffice work on Android, which has been significantly reused here and, and built on top of. There's also a tool called LOConf, which is faster than using the command line conversion, which is interesting, really. We should speed up our command line conversion tools. Uh, but you know, some people use LibreOffice to automatically batch convert documents, and that brings a number of problems with it. Uh, but it turns out using LibreOffice Kit is significantly faster. Oh, and we can use this actually inside LibreOffice Online. We, we have a nice little service that's quite cute where you can send a, a little HTTP post containing your document and tell it what format you want back, and it'll convert it for you. So look at that, a cloud document conversion service. It's quite, quite a useful feature, as we'll, uh, as we'll see later. So how does it all work? Well, I pointed out this side before. Of course, there's a client as well. Uh, so this is running in your browser on your PC or your touchy tablet or whatever it is. And there's a chunk of HTML and JavaScript there, and it's built on top of Leaflet, um, which is a mapping widget. I'll stand still for the photo. It's wonderful, wonderful. Um, and Leaflet have a nice logo like this. And we, <laughs> so we have a web socket between the two, which gives us very low latency. Um, which is very nice and a nice persistent connection. Um, but sadly, we need HTTP as well for various corner cases of downloading things uh, that browsers like to have as uh, HTTP, um, which, is, which is a shame. Let me just see if I can give you a, a quick demo. Let me see, Let me see if, it's, uh, if it's going to fly. So, so here is a CV for a graphic designer. Yes, I think I've mangled this at some stage in the past. Um, so you know, just to persuade you that, in fact, you can type into it, you know, I'll type into it like this. And you'll see some pretty weird stuff. So in fact, although it's pretty easy to do stuff with images, this is a sort of custom shape in a weird uh, you know, Microsoft document and so on. So this is pretty nice. And it's WYSIWYG editing. So you know, you're, um, you're doing real uh, page layout, um, actually, in the document. Now, if you compare some of the alternatives out there, um, they can preview nicely, as, as Wizzy, you know, what you see is what you get. Um, but as soon as you, uh, you know, start to edit, they go into a different cut-down Java mode that doesn't really work, which is a pain. Um, so what, what else can I show you? I can show you some search stuff. Let me search for yeah, TH, the GIMP. You know. um, so I can, can come through this document. And, and so far, I hope it looks to you like um, everything is text, right? You know, I, can, I can select it. I can and do this sort of stuff. I can make things bold and italic and underline them and all this good stuff. You know, the keyboard shortcuts you're, you're used to. Um, and it, it all seems quite nice, and it's relatively snappy. Of course, it's snappy because it's on my machine. I'm going to have to uh, you know, persuade you it's reasonably snappy remotely as well. Um, and we'll, we'll go into exactly how this works. But one thing I wanted to show you was just to uh, look at how, what, what's going on under the hood. So, so one of the things that's quite nice here is that you know, uh, Chrome, of course, has this lovely debugging thing. And what you can see immediately here is that actually, although this looks like text that you can edit and interact with and fool around with, in fact, it's a bitmap. It's a square 256 pixel bitmap. And next to it is another one and another one and, and so on. So although this seems to be a nice, interactive, smooth uh, you know, office suite experience driven with text, actually, it's a whole load of pixels that are coming from uh, you know, the other side of the world. Which is, which is pretty nice. Uh, let, uh, one of the interesting things about that, then, is that uh, you know, we, can, um, we can scroll, obviously, very quickly as you, as you scroll around the document. In theory, he says, oh, look at that. That's absolutely terrible, isn't it? Um, but you can zoom in and out. Um, and you're going to get you know, a, a nice behavior here so that when you're on your tablet and you're pinching to zoom, you know, you're going to get that 60 frames a second beautiful experience you're expecting. And you're expecting your browser, you know, even your browser will do an incremental re-render of that stuff won't it, as, it, as it happens. Um, so that's pretty nice. What else can I show you? Uh, why don't I show you a simple spreadsheet? I, got, I think I've got one here, you know, just, to, uh, just to even it out. I know Icus in the audience here, and he'll want to see a spreadsheet. You know? So here it is. You know. Why not? And it's drawing a little chart, and you, know, you can fiddle with your, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, make this 15, and your sine wave will go more wiggly, or you can make it you know, uh, 20, and it's even more excitable. Um, and you can see the formulae here, and you have a, you know, a simple formula bar and headers and rows. I mean, it, it's extremely minimal editing environment, at least um, you know, to us there's a huge value in getting this online and getting it available to everyone. Um, our plan is to enrich the editing experience uh, much more as we go ahead, um, and I'll talk about it maybe in a bit. So that's my demo. How does it work? Well, I think I showed you the tiles already. But LibreOffice Git has this API, so it's a C and or C++. We're very agnostic language-wise. The main two languages are supported. 
Um, I think even there's some Python bindings. I think Michael somewhere writes beautiful Python bindings for them, if you like that, and perhaps others. Um, these basic conversion operators, so you can load documents and save them in different types, simple stuff. But you can also start to paint tiles, and you get bitmaps out of them um, of any size you like. Um, and you can you know, introspect the document, find out how many pages it is, what the size of it is, and so on. Um, and you can switch between parts. So you know, we try and pour all of the applications into one mold. So spreadsheets, sheets, are parts, um, sort of an integer off offset, um, and uh, slides are parts as well. Then there's some editing operations. So you can post key events in and mouse events and Uno commands and you know, paste stuff and all, all of that, um, the good richness that you can see there. And it's served by this, uh, this server, a daemon, that um, basically manages and handles all of the uh, communication there and, and caches the tiles. And, and there's really uh, two levels of cache there. So one is when you have the document that's actually saved, uh, you want to be able to continue to see that. And then you also want to be able to see the editable version. So there's kind of a bifurcation there uh, between it. And then we have a very simple protocol. It's extremely simple. We have a WebSocket, which you may or may not know is a binary uh, protocol underneath. Um, and on top of that, we layer a text protocol, uh, astounding in its simplicity. So you know you can load uh, various pieces, pass URLs, invalidate areas, so ask them to be re-rendered, um, and get fetch, fetch tiles and so on. Uh, push key codes uh, into the, uh, into the uh, server. So yeah, and if you've got a big binary blob, you send a new line, and you know, there it goes. Um, Leaflet is um, originally a map library, um, so your document is actually a map. Isn't that good? And I, and I think the map library has all sorts of you know, code for sort of doing spherical something or others that we turn off because documents thus far are not mapped onto a globe. But maybe one day, you know, we'll have spherical documents, and then we'll be able to, uh, you know, do more. I don't know. Um, so this uses tiles as well, and it's just saved us a lot of work with uh, the infrastructure so we can get there quickly, you know, do all this gesture and, and, and pieces there. Uh, but then there's, of course, lots of work on top of that to do the editing, uh, editing as well. So if you look at your document, obviously there are a lot of things that change in your document. And we don't really want to be redrawing tiles on the other side of the world uh, just when we select text. It would really suck if, as you moved your cursor, you know, we'd have to draw new tiles and then send them all over the world, and you know, this would be really silly. It would be really dumb, right? You know, that, that would be monumentally awful. When you consider the remote desktop case, that's what they're doing. It's really that bad. You, know, you send your event, and it comes back with a, a picture of a, a selection that got bigger. And you'll discover this kind of interactive behavior is, is relatively rare. And these things. So we don't do that. We send very small messages with the coordinates of, for example, where the selection is. And uh, you know, these handles are then rendered in a layer over the top. So there's a nice SVG layer sitting on top and blinking the cursor like this. And there's no bandwidth used to blink the cursor, which is quite useful. Um, presumably, you know, on the, on the alternative side of the world, every time the cursor blinks, a message goes uh, across the server uh, in traffic and, you know, and a picture with it if you're not careful. So um, you know, selection handles for resizing shapes and so on in the document, uh, the same story. Um, cursors, um, cell cursors in calc, and so on. So there's a few of those, and perhaps more of them in future for table, uh, table manipulation. I, I don't know. We'll see. So it all looks good, but there are some interesting problems underneath. As you may have seen, my, my talk is uh, more about the, the problems than the, uh, the solutions, but let's see. Uh, maybe it's got some solutions, too. So here's my goal. Um, I want to get about 1,000 concurrent users on a large-ish machine. Okay? So a 32 gig of RAM seems like, well, it's, it's quite a small amount of RAM for a large-ish machine, if you're, if you're really into big machines. Um, but, you know, it seems reasonable. So the nice thing about having 1,000 users is it makes it very easy to divide your gigabytes into megabytes and so on per user. So that's 32 megabytes uh, each. And the corollary of this is pretty simple. That if you can share something across multiple users, you get a 1,000-fold memory win out of it. And that's kind of useful. You know? So if you can get this string shared in both processes, or this page shared in both processes, uh, we save really a lot of space. Uh, so our 4K page becomes a 4-byte page, effectively, per user. Right? So we want to do that. And of course, everyone tells you you should never optimize before profiling. I tell people this all the time. So after a bit of optimizing without profiling, I decided to go and profile the thing and discover that what I was doing was completely useless. So you know, some people never learn, but you could. So, you know. Don't optimize before profiling. Um, so I fired up Massive to look at where our um, memory use is. And this is a tile bench. It's just a little program that benchmarks rendering tiles. 
And I was pretty convinced that the strings would be the problem. I think the strings may be in uh, green or, or so something like this. Um, and actually, it turns out this huge red thing is the problem, and there's just some horrendously stupid um, uh, Kyrie manipulation. And so, you know, within a few um, minutes, we uh, saved eight megabytes a user, and with another few, uh, five lines of patch later, we were down from uh, 38 to 23 megabytes a user. And there's still some huge just fail going on here in the background. You know, so, so LibreOffice Kit is a nicely, nice API, but behind it, you need to understand there is a LibreOffice, you know, and it is being trained. It is being remedially educated in, in, in good behavior. But still, it likes to create big windows that you can't see and then draw things into them if you're not careful. And uh, so this, I think, will also save um, some CPU time, um, which, is, which is good. Um, however, I mentioned the sharing thing, and it's, it's worth then understanding that inside this sort of web service daemon box, we work quite hard to share memory. So there's a thing called a broker daemon. And um, what we like to do is do a thing called, uh, if you've seen use KDE, it has a thing called KDE in it. Um, that reduces the link time for the C++ apps it, it launches, but, but also shares a lot of memory uh, between them, which is great. We want to do something similar. So we have a, a broker daemon that spends its life just sitting there spawning, uh, forking worker threads. Um, so it comes up and initializes lots of things and you know, stashes all of that hard work away so that you don't then need to take the CPU time and worse the RAM in each of these processes. And we'll look at some of that in a second. And you have all of these uh, LibreOffice Kit processes here sitting around, um, entombed in a jail, a CA true jail. And uh, they make tiles which are then served out to the wild world uh, down here, which is, uh, which is great. So, so we, we looked at then the heap to see how much heap was being uh, you know, uh, burnt for pointlessly. And this is after the you know, several uh, easy wins. There's still a chunk of uh, stuff here in red that can be immediately pulled out, I think. It's just about nine meg of waste uh, per, per client there, just allocating bitmaps we don't need in the drawing layer. Um, but beyond that, it, it's looking pretty good. So I mean, after we pull those out, which I think is, again, probably an hour-long hack, um, 14 megabytes, of which about 12 megabytes are shareable. So we should be able to share a whole load of strings, all of, much of the configuration, um, uh, actually, the strings live in you know, the strings I split out here, and things like the UI icons. Like, why are we, you know, spending money and time loading UI icons? Um, there's, there's various bits of silly things there, and the you know service service stuff as well. We can save. So there's various registries for internal components. So I think that with only a day of work or so, we can get this to sort of under five meg uh, per user, which is encouraging, of course. Oh, let me talk about the strings. So one of the nice things about our strings is that we, uh, we control our own string class, which is uh, very elite. Um, and uh, we have an elite hack here, which is that the reference count is not just a, an atomic uh, reference, because it's got to be work across threads. But this is an immutable string. So every time you mutate it, you allocate a new one, which is exactly what we want uh, if we're going to share the original strings. And also we have this bit flag on our, uh, some bit flags at the top of the reference count. Um, the lowest one of them is called the static flag. So if you keep referencing your string, as you could, like take a billion references to your string, eventually you hit the static flag and you, you don't ever wrap around your reference count, which is quite useful. Um, and subsequently, you never touch that page again. Because the worst thing to do is to you know, allocate all your strings, pack them all into a page, and then immediately start touching it for no reason, writing to it. This would be really stupid. So um, we should be able to allocate all these strings and then just staticize them all and have all of the, the basic data set that we need in a you know, single page, single chunk of physical memory there on all of the, uh, all the nodes and, and, of course, read-only, which would be great. Um, a better way to waste memory is uh, with ELF linking. Well, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a good way to waste memory. Um, so, you know, the Floss ecosystem has this wonderful habit of you know, just creating hundreds of libraries, you know? Um, why have uh, one library for glib when you could have five, you know? Why, why have one for GTK when you could split it into several other small libraries and link them all, and then have some plug-in libraries as well, and so on and so on. Um, and each of these libraries, uh, unfortunately, wastes memory. Um, so you, know, you need all of this, uh, this, this global state that's uh, there. And we can get rid of some of it by uh, using LDBind now at the bottom. So the symbol pieces we can share across all these processes. Uh, but you know, unfortunately, the global data we have to initialize, and, and, and you know, it's not, not going to work nicely. Um, and the LibreOffice you see now uh, in front of you is using something like uh, 200 or so uh, of these shared libraries. Uh, 
211, I think, at the moment, of which almost certainly most of the, uh, you know, this, these sections are wasted. But, um, you know, it's only 800K, but it's still worth getting rid of, you know. It's, it's not, I'm not liking our budget. Um, also, we're using a whole, load of, um, a whole load of pages. So, I mean, 88 meg is really quite a lot of 4K pages. So the poor old kernel, I, I, I'm hoping that it's not generating page table entries for all of these things for each user. I imagine it's doing something terribly efficient internally. Um, but there's quite a lot of them, uh, embarrassingly many. It would be wonderful if we could use 4 megabyte pages instead. Uh, it would help our TLB accesses, and you know, life would be uh, a lot better. But I think for linking, that's a really big ask. Uh, we'll see. Maybe we can. Uh, maybe there is some kernel engineer, kernel hacker, glibc person that has crept in here today that is going to fix this problem for me and make everything uh, more efficient. Um, of course, we could link everything into a single blob, um, which at least helps reduce quite a lot of these wasted, fragmented library things. But yeah, it's pretty nice to be able to reuse your existing PC product with exactly the same code you use on your PC for LibreOffice Online. So you're supporting one binary, some one configuration. It just renders stuff differently. Uh, well, it's the same, but using a different, different API methods uh, for desktop and uh, server. So eh, you know, maybe we get to pay the cost. Here's, um, here's a look at just some um, PMAP output. So looking at the proportional set size, which tries to work out how many users of a page there are and then sort of divides the cost up by as many users as there are. Um, measuring memory usage is pretty tricky business. Um, so uh, before we did this bitmap optimization, it was quite a lot per user. As you can see, just stopping doing stupid stuff helped quite a bit there. And there are various little hacks along the bottom, but uh, pre-init is essentially uh, you know, using this broker process to initialize as much as we can in LibreOffice before we fork um, so it's all, all those pages can be shared. Um, there's much more work to do here in terms of static icing those strings properly and so on. Um, and there's lots more things we can do there. So you could imagine, for example, if the glyph cache, you know, when you render glyphs, they turn into pixels, and we cache those. Well, at least we should cache them. Uh, I think this is now inside Cairo uh, after, after quite a long sterling work. But you should be able to cache those for all fonts at all sensible sizes ahead of time. So you, you, know, you take another five seconds to start up, but then you have this massive shared blob of rendered glyphs that you can just stamp very, very quickly, which would be nice. So there's more we can do there. Um, so yeah, so less than five megabytes of heat for Hello World. But Hello World is not a very good document. It's not very big. Um, so what about 100 pages of text? So you know, for 100 pages of text, and this is just the demo text, F3, you know, filled out and pasted down, um, we get something like 1.4 megabytes, which is pretty, pretty cheap, I think. Now, of course, if you're going to paste huge images uh, into your document and embed you know, monster movies and DVDs and so on, uh, which you can do, um, it's going to create a problem. Ultimately, we're going to need to limit the memory uh, that each, each user can uh, consume. Um, but you know, my, my hope is that it's uh, quite, quite feasible for, for documents. The other problem with um, browsers is that, I don't know if you use the browser like I do, but I just carry on opening tabs endlessly until something gives. And um, the browsers have got wise to me recently. They've started to close them silently without telling me, you know, sort of like 20 down the stack or something. Um, but usually I notice my machine starts to grind to a halt, and I think, oh, I better kill Chrome again or something, you know? And, um, and that's great. You know, uh, it's a very nice life cycle uh, mechanism. Unfortunately, um, when this is in the cloud, you know, it's the collective experience of the world slowing to a halt um, is probably not one that we can afford. Um, so, uh, so the nice thing, of course, about how we run this is that we can, you know, we can be pruning these processes and, and saving these files down in the background. So as soon as you're switching away from the tab, we can notice that actually you're probably not interested in this document after a few seconds or minutes of not coming back to it. We can say, oh, you know, that's... that's that idiot Michael opening another tab, one for each document, and we'll just pull that document out, yank it out. And at least we'll stop sending him updates for his document. You know, he can get a, a full refresh uh, when he comes back to it, if ever. Um, um, and so any experts in scheduling algorithms that want to, you know, sort of balance the available memory versus the number of users versus who saw a page last, versus whether it's focused versus, you know, this is a, some research papers here that you could publish. Um, and of course, generic remote desktops really suffer here. You know, if you're, if you're going to have a, a generic remoting solution and you've loaded lots of desktops and lots of desktop apps, 
they're not really designed for this kind of checkpoint, save, restore thing. I mean, you can do virtualization and then, you know, serialize this huge whack of memory or something. They're not very clever. Uh, it doesn't, I don't think, work very well. So we have a huge uh, win there from being able to lifecycle manage these on the server. So that's, that's the whole memory, uh, memory story. Um, what about load? So CPU load is another uh, obvious important aspect of scalability. Here is a, I don't know if you can see the sOffice.bins, but there's quite a lot of them uh, down here. And, uh, you know, 1,390 sleeping processes. I like this, you know. So this is, uh, this is actually a live uh, session in Lago, uh, Florida. And, you know, why do hardware vendors invest in ever deeper sleep states? You know, the, the power off the server sleep state, you know? Um, well, it turns out that loads of servers and things out there are basically not being used. The computer is too clever, you know? It's not, not doing anything. Of course, unless it's, you know, Norbert's uh, build server that is churning LibreOffice builds uh, back to back, at which point the machine tends to you know, melt itself into a heap and, and die after a while because it's, it's not expecting load. Um, so anyhow, this, this machine here with that spec has something like 800 uh, active users, of which 150 to 200 are uh, concurrent. And the load average, as you see, is uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 0 0.7. And which seems, seems reasonable. And they're using X11. It's not exactly our, our use case. But I think, well, I'm, I'm trying to persuade you that this is not a huge, a huge problem. Um, there's also been some great work here to uh, improve things. We're using a thing called Vigra for doing our pixel bashing. Um, it's actually horribly ugly, uh, aliased, unpleasant, giant C++ templates, impossible to read and debug. Um, and surprisingly inefficient, despite all of that. Um, so we did quite a number of... Um, uh, fixes, one of them I particularly liked was, uh, you know, you have a one-bit bit mask, and it's, it's big, because we're going to use it for clipping, and, you know, it's iterating there, doing bit masking operations to set each bit to zero, you know, like, uh, da, 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 all the way through. Uh, not very clever. So we, we got some nice wins with just sort of mem sets from that that, you know, gave hu huge speed ups. But now, uh, thankfully, Quailon has uh, converted it to uh, use Cairo, which is awesome. So now we have, you know, actual real... Uh, hardware accelerated assembler fallbacks for all, all these uh, beautiful anti-alias uh, rendering pieces. So, you know, thanks. Thanks, Quail. And that happened after several of my screenshots and my demo, so it's not in this live code. So if you see something horrible, it's probably gone already. Okay. Um, bandwidth. Okay, so bandwidth is another thing, and it's, you know, it can be somewhat expensive. This is the back of the envelope calculation for the manic typer. So, you know, it's possible that somebody spends half of their time actually typing like a typist, you know, transcribing stuff. And it's possible they do it in a way that damages multiple of these 256 pixel uh, tiles. Obviously, that doesn't necessarily happen very often. You know, text can rewrap re around the line, but you know, I don't know. it's an estimate. And if you spend half your life actually typing, um, the compression ratio is based on um, some, some tests we did around text. Often, you, know, you, don't, you have a simple white background and you have black text with some anti-aliasing around it. And this seems like a reasonable, a reasonable ratio. These are your tile sizes. And you come up with this, this raw bandwidth requirement per user of something like 270 kilobits a second. Which, for those of you who started on a 64 kilobit modem, like me, if you were lucky, um, seems a lot of, lot of bandwidth. Um, but in the modern world of waste everywhere, um, this is about you know, 7,500 uh, users on a, on a 2 gigabit uh, a second connection, which is, you know, is, a, is a reasonably uh, good uh, number of users. I would argue, uh, particularly since this is a, a, a highly under-optimized from bandwidth perspective as yet. So NX, who do, I think, you know, something at least comparable, um, claim they need 20 kilobits per user, per se kilobits per second per user, which is about a tenth of my inflated estimate. Um, so, you know, there's an argument that you don't need to see immediately every one of the uh, key presses that you type three in a second um, on the screen as you press it. Um, so you can you know, perhaps avoid some, uh, some things there. We're also sending in a complete 256 pixel square tiles instead of deltas. So you know, something simple like moving from a big thing to a remarkably smaller thing, that is the uh, glyph you just typed, should give a really nice uh, factor improvement. I think there's a lot of scope for uh, fun work there to shrink this down and get some kind of 10x win. Um, ultimately, I would quite like to see the glyph cache on the client and not on the server to save us memory and also to hide uh, some of this latency so that you, know, you press the key, and we have already predicted what glyphs we should be putting where by the time the key is pressed, so that we can be stamping it straight on the screen in the client and you know, letting the server rest like it likes to. So yeah, lots of, lots of fun optimizing uh, to go on that. 
So security, I've got a few more things uh, later about what we could use help with uh, in this area. Um, but basically, we have what's uh, you know, uh, arguably a layered approach here. So inside the box, you have a scary LibreOffice kit, a rendering instance. And with the best will in the world, eventually, they're going to bust through all of our, our hard work and, and, and get out. So we're pretty scared of this guy. He has a dodgy document inside himself. But having said that, we have the, you know, an incredibly good coverity score. How much this means, I don't know. Uh, but we do some pretty, pretty aggressive fuzz testing. I don't know if you went to Qualon's talk, you could have seen it you know, running for weeks and weeks, you know, trying to find ways to break out of the box. And my hope is that if we use the best tools and we throw enough hardware at it, we'll be you know, approaching a step of the head, at least of the script kiddies. Um, so we're beating the, uh, you know, well, almost any other project's coverity score. We do a whole load of uh, load crash testing. So we regression test our 55, 65, 75. Thousand documents uh, very regularly in a tight loop, uh, thanks to Marcus, who's fallen asleep. Um, but you know, never mind; these things happen. Um, and uh, we have a, a. Then we inside, you know, outside all those sort of basic trying to make the software hard um, pieces, we then have a ch root um, per document and, and per user, so that this thing is isolated inside a ch root. Inside that ch root, we have a very very sparse file system because we don't want anything bad in there that you could use to do something even worse. So. You know, there's no, uh, you know, there's no shell. There's no, you know, it's, it's just very, very, very minimal. Um, which is good, because that saves resources and inodes, you know, when we're having thousands of documents uh, open to. Um, the thing I'd really like to find someone who would like to do is to implement setcom uh, BPF so that we can, we can cut down the set of system calls that you can use so that ye oldy weirdo system call that is not used frequently and it might have a vulnerability that we can further shrink you know, the number of uh, entry points there. And of course, the document data is specific to the ch root. So your document is only living inside this guy. So um, you know, there's, there's obviously no access to, to anything else. And then, of course, we you know, put it inside a virtual machine or a Docker container, so you have that you know, extra layer of uh, protection. Nothing's, nothing's perfect. And you know, then, then um, put it on my computer, you bury in the ground and turn off, and then it might be you know, a perfectly are perfectly safe. But either way, my, I, I'm optimistic that we can do a, a good job of damage limitation. Because our friends at Google say they get some very strange documents that have been crafted to uh, you know, uh, do, do odd things. So here we go. Um, the web browser itself uh, provides a, a number of opportunities for improvement, which are probably worth um, looking at now. So, so LibreOffice is, is a pretty powerful piece of software. It it's, you know, runs on almost every uh, operating system you want to think about and integrates with lots of uh, copy and paste functionality, but the web browser really takes the biscuit. I mean, you know, in terms of API surface and what we can do, um, sadly, at the moment, we can only copy plain text, which is a shame, because we have all of this rich semantic information. We have charts, we have spreadsheets, we have formulae, we have rich formatting, all this sort of thing. And here's how we do it. I mean, even the text is not easy. So what we do is, uh, when people select stuff, we wait for the selection changing to stop. So you know, the text has been selected. Um, about 300 milliseconds or so. So you know, if you're a ninja, you can break it. You know? Control C, Control V, and it, it, it won't work. So you know, pause after your Control Cs. Um, and then we fetch the text from the remote thing into a member variable, because we need this later when we're going to do a paste, or do the actual copy, rather. Because um, it's not, you can't actually fetch that during the copy callback. As you touch the control key, we create a hidden text area. It's absolutely wonderful. And um, we, we select the text inside it and, and focus it so that if we're going to get a copy, if they press control C, we will then get the event we need. So there's a nice little hidden text area with a dummy text in it. And then we can get the copy event. And we can fill it with the text that we've stuffed away in the member variable here. OK? Don't you love it? It's absolutely brilliant, isn't it? Um, anyway. <clears throat> 1.2, paste, um, yes, yeah, so we don't have to pre-populate the text area here, we just have to mash stuff into it, so, uh, you know, that's, that's okay. And it's possible that we can do a better job here, um, because, you know, we're on the receiving end, we actually get, get uh, text of potentially different, um, different types, uh, which is great. Um, so we can notice it's arrived and push it and then fetch the new tiles and, and show it. But, but the slightly sad thing here is that with the right API, you know, we could copy and paste just very richly. You know, it's, it's my dream to have the, uh, you know, the Microsoft Office on one side and the text selected in it and paste it into the browser and it just, it just works and it looks beautiful and it retains all of the, all of the content. You know, and we're working hard on the filter piece 
uh, but we need the API surface to do a good job. Um, and really, a copy and paste API needs several things, uh, basically. It needs uh, content type negotiation. So you can say, I'd rather not have text if you've got something better. You know, what about, you know, RTF or, you know, so something else, HTML even. Um, and we also need the ability to do real work in the copy event handler. So, you know, that means remote uh, process, uh, you know, remote IP RPC. And I guess the, probably the problem here is that most copy events thus far are using just the browser and the DOM and there's something clever happening with data that you have on the local machine um, rather than data you have remotely. And it's, it's important that we can go to that remote data because you really don't want every time you select the whole spreadsheet 300 milliseconds later for, for it all to be shoved into your client. That would really not be clever, would it? Um, so it's, it's really important that we can catch those events and do a good job. Now, the other thing that really is unpleasant is printing. Um, so ignore the fact that it would be really nice to know what printers are attached to your machine, um, what paper sizes, what page, paper tray sizes, what you know, feed options they have in them, what kinds of paper. I mean, forget that. that that's obviously unrealistic. Um, but just being able to actually trigger the printing dialog would be quite nice, you know? I mean, I have sympathy with the idea that the JavaScript shouldn't be, you know, printing stuff out in your basement, you know? So when you browse to news.com or whatever, you know, some huge advert is printed on your, you know, your paper automatically, that's fair enough. But at least, you know, having some direct access to the, the print dialog would be really, uh, really rather helpful. And the nice thing is, of course, that PDF is the obvious mechanism here, and browsers are typically very good at PDF uh, these days. And uh, we use it as our CUPS metafile format on Linux anyway. So we're good at making PDFs. And, you know, well, they'll probably get the page sizes sorted out somehow, and the envelope labels might match up anyway, if you're lucky. Um, but yeah, just it would be nice if we're able to print. Chrome has an extension, I think, here that helps uh, significantly. Um, I think uh, Mozilla doesn't. Ah, cool. So. I just do what my slides say. So let's see if we can do something, uh, something fun. What was this one? Ah, oh, basic presentation. Oh, here we go. Um, so one of the things that we can do is that we can start to download this file in all sorts of different formats. So you know, we can grab this thing as a PDF uh, pretty easily. Uh, you can download it as ODP. We can do that sort of dynamic uh, format conversion on the web, which is, uh, which is pretty nice. What else? Of course, there's all style editing, undo, redo. You probably don't um, want to see any of that. Now, what does this thing do? Ah, help. If you need help, you can get it there. Um, there's a good button you can press, which, um, which does a nice thing for, uh, for a slide uh, presentation. So it converts your slideshow or to SVG and, um, and then shoves it to you so that you can uh, you know, uh, walk through it. And in theory, you can get uh, transitions and fades and you know, pictures of lovely things and I don't know, all this sort of text animation. And we, we're doing quite well. Look at this shape's change color. Look at that. You know? Have you ever seen? Have you ever tried to change a shape's color while you're animating it? You know? um, so, so this is actually a rather, a, rather ahead of what the, uh, the uh, alternatives out there are actually able to do. In fact, it's quite a pitiful um, set of transitions in the, uh, some of the alternatives. So you know, they, can't, they can't turn those things, or arrows around as they're going, you know, sort of thing. So that's pretty fun. And um, what else can we do? Um, oh yeah, let me show you a nice and more advanced spreadsheet, because you know, I'm going to mark us up. Where, where are we? Basic spreadsheet. Ha! Huh. You know, so we have. Um, here, here are some nice examples of you know text doing funny things and strike strikeouts and number formats and you know so, so it's a real spreadsheet. It's not just a you know load it and hope spreadsheet. It's not a show you the cached answer spreadsheet. It's a let's actually try and do the calculation right and, and, and do a good job of it spreadsheet, which is which is nice. You know so you can uh, hopefully get a really high fidelity view of what your uh, what you've got there and do then some minimal editing with it. Obviously, as uh, as I said, it's not a incredibly full-featured editing suite yet. Um, what else? Aha, uh -huh. yes. Um, is that, I'm, 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 okay, deeper down. So I, I'm supposed to show you this. So um, we, we're looking at some um, collaboration. Obviously, collaborative editing is a, is a vital thing uh, on the web, and uh, you know, people sort of associate it with online office suites. And I'll show you some, um, some, some of how we're going to do this uh, in future, but I'll just show you the, the limited shared editing we have at the moment. So, this effectively then gives you a single, a single cursor so that you can, um, this is a, a Chrome and a Firefox on separate sides so you can see I'm not cheating. I have 10 minutes left. Awesome, I should talk more quickly. Um, so uh, you know, uh, we can type uh, you know, something beautiful in my daughter's uh, you know, uh, birthday party uh, thing here and we can you know, make the, the text bigger and you know, it's rendering effectively some, some quite nice custom art thing and as you can see the jaggies quite vigorously here that I hope will be Cairoized uh, very shortly. 
uh, when, when we do this again. Um, so that's pretty nice. And of course, uh, you know, just so you get the right idea, we can you know come over here and say you know uh, shared love or something like this. You know, so uh, so that's all good. Um, so shared editing is uh, you know the, the basics of this. But I'd quite like to show you the um, what we're going to be doing for uh, non-collaborative editing. So for example. Um, you know, at the moment, this is my presentation, and it's, it's relatively easy to uh, create a new window, and if you go home and play with this, you'll discover that this actually provides multiple cursors, multiple edit entry points, multiple selections, and is an underused feature. So I think we can expect lots of interesting improvements to come out of this work, but at least the feature conceptually is, you know, uh, is there. So um, here's, a, uh, here's some random statements that I'll waffle over. Please do read them uh, from cool people who are doing things and supporting work, uh, particularly iSwarp, who uh, have helped fund, substantially fund a lot of this work, and you know, this is kind of awesome vision uh, for a company. I love it. Um, own Cloud, obviously, uh, I've been demoing you uh, the Own Cloud integration there, um, which builds on top of work uh, actually done by um, WebODF people, um, but you know, free, so free software is great. Um, Colab, we announced uh, yesterday a partnership with to, uh, to take this to market, and you know, obviously we hope, hope to have many more. Um, we want to get this, this thing out there. Uh, there are lots of people who have actually done the work that are not me. And, uh, you know, uh, many heroic names here. Um, and most of them uh, collaborate sadly so far. We're trying to fix that problem by getting people involved. So it's very easy to get this thing. Um, all the demos that I showed you today are there, except my daughter's party invite. Um, so, you know, you can just download it now, uh, zip it update, and get it and play with it uh, on your own in device uh, pretty trivially. And you get that own cloud, uh, Collabra Online, and OpenSUSE a piece there. And, you know, send us some patches, send us some feedback. Um, the way to get involved is just go to the normal public dev list for LibreOffice, uh, clone the software. It's uh, pretty much all there. Uh, and, yeah, just the normal way to get involved with LibreOffice. And there's lots of things we'd love people to do. This is a feature I'd really like. It's a latency simulator. You know, something that reads data and doesn't give it to you for another however long you like, you know, 10 milliseconds, one millisecond. So we can, um, you know, more easily test with a defined ping uh, on a local machine and make sure our developers are really, you know, experiencing the joy of, uh, of being on the other side of the world, you know, just the physics of, of being uh, somewhere else. Um, a JavaScript, you know, bridge would be nice for scripting. Here's, here's one of the things that was said to me yesterday. So, um, one of the problems with open document formats and, and LibreOffice generally has been getting people to have software that will support it well. And there are many routes to try and fix this, encouraging vendors to implement good ODF support. But one of the beautiful things about LibreOffice Online is that it makes it possible to have that good support everywhere. So you can render your ODF and you get a really good result. Um, and so without needing to do anything to your PC or mobile device, without installing anything. And so when the next lame person says, I couldn't open your document, you know, you go, well, did you look at the link in your email that said, you know, it's over there. Just, you know, let me help you click on the browser, you know. Um, let, let me uh, plug your mouse back in, um, which is cool. Um, so hopefully that'll help. I'm just going to flick through these very, very quickly. There are lots of people who've done great work. Cloud integration remote files, obviously very important. Um, so, you know, being able to talk to different kinds of servers. Um, Android and cloud integration, it's obviously there uh, for a while, but you know, worth noting, there have been several improvements in the Android version 2 uh, for this 5.1 release coming out just after FOSDEM. Um, lots of improvements in mail merge embedding, a formula wizard. Um, Ica has done amazing things to the table uh, syntax and Excel uh, core, uh, calc core, let's say. <laughs> um, but they're not screenshotted, so they're not on the screen. I'm sorry about that. Um, a better statistics dialogue, uh, ping, export, and cal, search, you know, lots and lots of lovely, lovely things. Uh, lots of user experience improvements to make it easier to use. Um, better stuff in Impress. Um, new OpenGL transitions that are interoperable and pretty. Um, MathML, cut and paste, Keynote 6 support. They completely changed their file format, I understand, so we had to you know, uh, redo this, thanks to David Tarden. Um, lots of work on OpenGL to accelerate rendering and make it uh, snappier. Uh, menu bars have been substantially reorganized, so you can retrain yourself into the new world. Um, the sidebar has been improved by all sorts of good people. Um, lots of new features there. I think there's a chart sidebar now, so you can um, edit your charts from Marcus. Um, but lots of other little bits of uh, cleanup. Um, all over the place in the sidebar, so you know, lots of nice, um, nice stuff. So, LibreOffice is getting better. It's awesome, and uh, there was a huge amount of stuff done in the last year. And I, I'd like to, you know, tell you progress is accelerating. You know, more and more people are interested. They want this thing. I think the online uh, piece is extremely exciting for many. 
uh, just getting access to that, uh, that functionality. And, and in a way that gives you, you know, those privacy guarantees that you, know, you can control it uh, and lock it down and make it securely uh, your own. So yeah, if you're interested in helping out, grab me or others on IRC. Uh, That's a great way, or just mail me a thing in the slides. So you've been very patient and good. Thank you for your time. Do we have time for questions? Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Awesome. There's a gentleman over here. You get a free sticker with every question asked. Well, I know, I know. Yeah. They're, they're queuing in the back to get in, you know, just for the stickers. Um, excellent. So if you use time rendering to render your document, how does it work with screen readers? Yes, that's a brilliant question, and uh, I was hoping you wouldn't ask that one. Um, so I, I think um, if you are uh, someone that is visually impaired, um, for example, um, the great thing is that you're going to need customized technology to deal with your impairment. And I would strongly recommend that one of those customizations would be using the PC version <laughs> and downloading the file out of own cloud using the own cloud integration and then uh, using it through that, that means. I think that's a, a better way to get an accessible experience. So yes, I mean, that, that, that's the trade-off that you take from having a, uh, you know, a high fidelity rendering, uh, rendering model like that. So. Good question. I love it. Is there another good question? Ah, yes. Hi. Hello. Um, will any of the, the performance improvements from the online version benefit the desktop application? Yes, yes of course. And that, I'm, I'm excited about that because I, you know, I have a passion for making things faster and hopefully not breaking them at the same time. That's my, that's my goal. Um, and, and the beautiful thing about this is that there should be hosters everywhere that start to have a financial incentive to optimize LibreOffice. So you may think that the world is about you know, programmers you know, doing things for fun, and it is, but if we can provide a virtuous circle where there's a financial incentive to improve something, then my hope is that it, you know, we, we get a lot quicker and better. So yeah, so, yeah I, I, I'm loving it. If you want to make it faster, you know, come and see me. I'll, I'll you know, help you. Jeff, you're going to tell me there's about three web APIs that do exactly what no. I want. You know? <laughs> no, no, I'm not, actually. <laughs> oh, cool, good. Um, it, it seems to me that... Um, the big advantage of doing the tiling method as opposed to building an entirely new UI in HTML, which as I understand it, is what the two main competitors have done, is that you can provide a richer editing experience because you're not as limited by web browsers. Yeah, so, so there's a degree, large degree of truth in that. <clears throat> I think our main competitors, so I think Microsoft is using quite a similar model to us. So Are they using tiles? Because Google Docs is definitely HTML that's right. yeah. widgets. But, but, but if you look at um, you know, Office... Um, uh, 360... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, something. 366 this year, they're calling it, I think. Yes. 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 Um, anyway, Microsoft are doing a great job. And, and you know, they have a similar problem, you know, but on a bigger scale, I think, in terms of the, the deep legacy code base. I guess Ica talks yeah. about it in, in talk online. So, but, but I think, at least if for the WYSIWYG, they do pagination and preview... Um, for, for Word, for example, and it, it looks pretty bitmappy to me. Mm -hmm. But yes, I mean, so, so we do get that high fidelity, we get the, you know, weird, uh, exotic language support. So, you know, if you have mm. a, a very minority language with 10 people using it and it's got weird glyphs and horrendous shaping problems, assuming that it's on the server and it works fine, it'll work everywhere on every device. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can do the mixed language spell checking, you know, and all of those weird line breaking and hyphenation things and, and get, you know, just really good fidelity end to end. But of course, at the sacrifice of, you know, you then need to use the API to introspect the content. So that, that was an initial observation. There was a question coming. Oh, sure. So but let okay. me point out that it's not yeah. completely hopeless with accessibility. The, 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 you should be able to get your cursor position and, and, and integrate those events, assuming you can do those round trip calls you're going to need to do in the callbacks inside the browser, assuming there are any callbacks. But from what I see of WebARIA, it looks very much like just annotation, which I think is a bit lame. I think Web could do better. Yeah, I, I certainly think you would have difficulty building a client-side accessibility shadow DOM out of, yeah, out of would, what you're doing. It would not be fun, let's say. Yeah. So the question is, <coughs> um, uh, as we know, web browsers suck, and they're clearly limiting what you're trying to do. Um, <laughs> Uh, have you sort of had conversations with or filed debugs about the remaining things which are tying you to the ground and preventing your rocket from reaching the stratosphere? I know. That I know. us terrible web browser makers browser are limit at the top. limiting you with our terrible software. 
No, but I'm very happy to uh, talk to any um, browser people who happen to be here. You know, so uh, that's great. Come and harass me at the end, and we can uh, connect you to the people who've, who've suffered. You know, the uh, the ignominy of a, of a poor solution there. So yeah, I mean, we'd love to work together and make it better. That's uh, that's the thing. Thank you. Are we out of time yet? Well, perhaps there's time for one last question. One last question. Ah. Oh, there's a hand over here. Go for it, sir. Oh, no, oh, there. Oh, yeah, yeah, quite, right. oh, okay. I always like to hear from yours. You know, it's, it's great. Go for it. <laughs> so, um, relating to the copy paste and also the accessibility. Sure. If you look at the, the way um, a PDF is rendered in, for example, Firefox, mm -hmm. what they do is they take text and put it uh, invisibly, so with 100%, uh, well, sorry, 0% translucency, or, sorry, 0% opacity okay. on top of the other text. Right. So that you can actually t select something which is invisible, uh, okay. and it's actually in the copy-paste buffer automatically. So you don't need to do your ninja in the 300 milliseconds. Did you look at that? Except it works really badly. <laughs> if you try and copy and paste stuff out of PDF.js, you'll find a lot of spaces in there that you didn't expect. I certainly find that. Yeah. yeah sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> so yes, there's, I think there's an increasing number of elite hacks we could do to make everything better. Um, but I think probably getting the infrastructure right in the first place would, would probably save us all a lot of uh, uh, hassle. Uh, particularly when you start looking at the JavaScript library that tells you whether you have this feature, and it's just you know just just this madness of checking versions and, and doing stuff already. Um, I think we should probably try and avoid um, avoid that. Feature detection. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you very much. You've been very good.